Hello marine biology students. In this video we're going to talk about a diversity of bilaterally symmetrical worms. There are many phyla which fall into this category of bilaterally symmetrical worms. The first of these that we'll talk about are the flatworms, phylum platyhelminthes. When we look at the basic characteristics of these worms, they have bilateral symmetry, so a top and a bottom and a right and a left side. They have three tissue layers, and they have a central nervous system. Including a brain, which is a cluster of nerve tissue in the head. They have a gastrovascular cavity like we saw with the cnidarians in that it was a single opening to that digestive compartment that one opening functions as both a mouth and an anus they do not have a body cavity to store their internal organ but they do have organs embedded within their body wall when we look at the basic lifestyle of these flatworms several are free living flatworms which we call turbellants. Some are going to be parasitic flukes, and some will be tapeworms. When we look at the reproduction of these flatworms, asexual reproduction can happen through fragmentation. And regeneration. Sexual reproduction is also possible. These flatworms are hermaphroditic having both male and female reproductive organs. Here we see these two turbellan flatworms participating in a mating ritual known as penis fencing. In this case, both flatworm has a needle-like penis and they are attempting to inject the other. For the flatworm that is successful, they will deposit sperm into the body of the other, and they avoid the cost of both healing the wounds and developing eggs that would be fertilized by those sperm cells. Our next phyla of bilaterally symmetrical worm are the ribbon worms from Phylum nemertia. What causes the nemertians to be distinct is that they have this long proboscis that they can use to surround and ensnare their prey items. They are all carnivores and they feed on other worms. So their basic characteristics, they have a long elastic body with a proboscis. This proboscis, it can evert from a pocket right above their mouth and it can surround their prey items. Nemertians have a complete digestive tract, meaning it's a digestive tube containing both a mouth and an anus at distinct ends of that digestive tube. There are other advancements in their bodily anatomy as well. They have a body cavity, which the flatworms did not, even though it is somewhat reduced and they have a circulatory system. Some of these ribbon worms can grow incredibly long, with some, one species reaching up to 30 meters or 100 feet in length, making it one of the longest invertebrates known. There are tapeworms that are found in whales that can also measure more than 100 feet in length. And even some of the tentacles of the cnidarians, which we had talked about earlier, can reach lengths in excess of 100 feet. So even though an organism is an invertebrate, they can still be exceptionally long. Our next phylum of worms are the nematodes, phylum nematoda. Most of these nematodes are very small, although some parasitic varieties can be large enough to see and even dissect as needed. They are bilaterally symmetrical with a complete digestive system and they have something called a hydrostatic skeleton.
in that there's an internal fluid-filled compartment that the muscles of the body can compress against to allow for movement. Nematodes often live in sediments, in the marine environments, in salt marshes, and even in other terrestrial environments as well. And they can range from being just a member of the sediment community eating detritus to potentially being parasites. Estimates on the actual numbers of species in this phylum range anywhere from 10,000 to 25,000, but it's likely even significantly higher than that. They make up such an important component of sediment communities. And just throughout the world, there are still many environments for us to test and identify all the nematodes that are present. One particular nematode of interest comes from the genus Anisakis. Here it's larva can be found within fish, and if fish is consumed raw by humans or other organisms, these parasitic larvae can end up being introduced to these organisms, causing a variety of illness and other symptoms. Our next group of worms are found primarily within the plankton. They are fish-like worms, known as arrowworms, or ketognaths. They come from phylum ketognatha. The basic characteristics of ketognaths is that they are planktonic. And widely distributed in all oceans. They have transparent stream-like bodies with fish-like fins and a tail. They are voracious predators in their environment. Where they can swim rapidly and feed on small planktonic crustaceans, fish larvae, and other plankton. There are about 130 recognized species, all of which are marine. The last group of bilaterally symmetrical worms that we'll discuss are the annelids, or segmented worms. They're in phylum annelida. Their basic characteristics are that they have internal and external body segmentation. They have a well-developed nervous system and brain. They have a closed circulatory system. They have bilateral symmetry. And their body cavity is a true coelom, which is lined with tissues derived from the mesoderm, as in higher animals. There are several different groups within phylum annelida that are of importance in the marine environment, the first of these being the polychaetes. The prefix poly means many. And kite refer to bristles. And so these polychaetes have many bristles on the outside of their body. They are the largest and most diverse group of segmented worms with about 10,000 species, nearly all of them being marine. Each segment has a pair of flattened extensions, or parapodia. Often with gills for gas exchange, and bristles called setae or chitae. Polychaetes range from being free-living carnivores Two deposit feeders, some are tube worms, and others are suspension feeders. Here we see representatives of some of the polychaetes, with the major polychaete structure being shown in the illustrated diagram, with their mouth and eyes and segments, the peripodium with the bristles or setae. And then we see a few photographs of individuals in the wild. The first one labeled A, this is a fireworm, and those red structures that you see along its back are its gills. What is less obvious are the glassy-like, needle-like hairs that are especially painful if you ever touch them. And, and so I would strongly encourage you not to touch fireworms because their name lives up to the sensation that it feels like. And then we see some of the tube worms with their bristles modified into a feeding appendage, allowing them to collect food particles suspended in the seawater. 
This is why they are suspension feeders. The next group of segmented worms are the Pogonophorans, or beard worms. And if you thought some of the other marine worms were weird, these are especially weird. So these beard worms have long extensions or tentacles, and it turns out that they do not have a digestive system at all. Instead, they absorb nutrients through these tentacles, and sometimes they even have symbiotic bacteria and archaea living with them. An animal of this size that does not have a digestive system is really remarkable. As I had mentioned, many have symbiotic bacteria. And some of these bacteria are even chemosynthetic. And that allows these beard worms to live in environments such as deep sea hydrothermal vents. And methane seeps. As we continue our discussion of the annelids, another group are leeches. While leeches are maybe more abundant in terrestrial aquatic environments, there are marine leeches as well. They have interior and posterior suckers which allow them to hold to prey. They parasitize invertebrates and fish. The photo on this slide is showing an interesting type of worm known as an echiurin. And what causes echiurins to be distinct from some of the other annelids is that externally they do not have clear segmentation. They have a non-retractable spoon-shaped or, or forked proboscis for feeding. They are deposit feeders. They often burrow in soft sediments, yet some live in corals. The fat innkeeper worm in the Pacific Northwest is an example of an echiurin. The last of the segmented worms that we'll talk about are another ones that secondarily lost their segmentation. These are the sipunculids, or peanut worms. Sipunks, as they are sometimes called, have a retractable proboscis. That is used for feeding. They are found mainly in shallow water. They are deposit feeders, burrowing in soft sediments. That finishes our discussion of worms. Now, before our next video, I would like you to think about what your favorite type of seafood is. Mine is coming up in the next video. All right, see you then.